jumping off in a number five spot, speed limits. Yeah, that's right, the queen can drive as quickly as she wants. Speed is nothing to the queen. But being the amazing queen that she is, she doesn't abuse this power. She's always a safe driver. Plus, nowadays, she doesn't really drive that much anyways, as she has a personal driver. But she can technically break any speed limit rules anywhere in the country. On top of being able to be a speed demon, she also doesn't have to drive with a license. Licenses are issued in the queen's name, yet she's the only person in the UK who doesn't legally need one. She also doesn't need a number plate on her car. Yeah, just breaking all the road rules. But fun little fact for you guys, the queen is actually quite good behind the wheel. She learned to drive during World War II when she operated a first aid truck. She also knows how to change a spark plug. In our number four spot, passports. Yeah, it seems like the queen doesn't need any form of ID. She's one of the few people in the world who doesn't need to have an official identity document. However, other members of the royal family are required to have one. Also, the queen is quite the traveler, which isn't a surprise seeing as she's the monarch of 16 realms. Also, she is actually the most widely traveled head of state in history, visiting over 116 countries during 265 official visits. Not too bad for someone who doesn't have a passport. And at number three, birthdays. Now this isn't technically a law, but it is something that only the queen has. She has not one, but two birthdays. Yeah, when you're the British head of state, one birthday is just not enough. Queen's actual birthday is on April 21st, however her official birthday is celebrated on a Saturday in June. Her actual birthday is marked publicly by a gun salute in central London at midday. This includes a 41 gun salute in Hyde Park, a 21 gun salute in Windsor Great Park, and a 62 gun salute at the Tower of London. For her official birthday celebrations, she is joined by other members of the royal family at the spectacular Trooping the Colour Parade. I have to say, two birthdays every year, it would be pretty awesome. Coming in at number two, taxes. Something people hate more than anything is paying taxes. It's just a pain in the butt. And if you don't get a return and owe money, it just stings that much more. When tax season rolls around, that's when I miss working at Cineplex for minimum wage. I would always get a nice chunk of change back from my taxes. But sadly, those days are over. All citizens in the UK and many other countries have to pay taxes depending on their earnings. But the Queen is exempt from this law. As it's written, the Crown has a legal tax exempt status because certain acts of Parliament do not apply to it. But I guess in 1992 she was feeling left out or something because she voluntarily paid taxes since then. Also to add on to this, the Queen can't be sued. Yeah, it's impossible, so don't even try. On top of that, she also has the right to not give evidence in a court. And she can't be prosecuted. Alright, and before we jump into our number one spot, I just want to remind you guys to please show some love by giving this video a big thumbs up and subscribing to our channel. And once again, stay tuned until the end of the video as I will be answering your questions. Alright, and in our number one spot, war. Yeah, so technically if the queen wanted to, she could start a war against any country at any moment. As we know in practice, these decisions are made by parliament, but they officially do need the queen's permission. Luckily, the queen is an amazing leader. She's calm and able to think with her head on straight, and she doesn't make decisions based off of being a hothead, unlike a certain other ruler. <laughs> Luckily, in the UK, only a monarch has the power to declare war and peace under the royal prerogative. And since the Second World War, there have been no declarations of war. But nonetheless, the British armed forces have taken part in armed conflict on numerous occasions. Yes, the queen is literally above the law. On top of being able to start a war, she also has the right to break any law. But as I said before, luckily the queen is quite modest. First up in the number 5 spot, she woke up one night to find a stranger in her bed. On July 9, 1982, a 31-year-old psychiatric patient named Michael Fagan scaled the Buckingham Palace drain pipe and made his way into Elizabeth's sleeping chambers. The man was dripping in blood from his hand from his climb to get inside, and then he took a seat on the queen's bed near the corner. She woke up and didn't panic, instead she had a 10 minute talk with the guy about his kids and his mental problems until a guard thankfully came in. They later found out that this wasn't his first time breaking in. Moving on to the number 4 spot, the Queen sent an email back in 1976. It's a long time ago. Queen Elizabeth sent her first email while taking part in a network technology demonstration on March 26, 1976. Now what did it say? It was kind of boring, some like navigational instructions. It'd be funny if it was like some juicy stuff like, Oh Charles, you're such a sexy son. Unfortunately it was nothing like that. Regardless, she is the first head of state ever to send an email and she's gotten very like tech savvy as of recent. She's got an iPad mini and um, she sends out a lot of emails. She doesn't write them, she has people for that. Next up at number two, the queen paid for her own wedding dress in coupons. 
Princess Elizabeth married Philip Mountbatten on November 20th, 1947. This was shortly after the end of the Second World War and the population of England was getting by on ration cards. Now this royal wedding was actually really practical, especially by royal standards, and the queen had to save up her own ration coupons to afford the dress she wanted. In the end she got an ivory satin gown designed by Norman Hartnell, and it was encrusted with 10,000 white pearls. That's a lot of coupons. But uh, pearls, cheaper than diamonds, right? Number 5. King Charles. The new King Charles, but whom was once Prince Charles, the infamous Prince Charles, yes. Seems him and Zeus have a couple of similarities there, you know? Kings of kings, and of course the whole wandering eye once in a while thing. That's right, Camilla and the prince, the infamous mistress to the once Princess Diana, may she rest in peace. The king has done some pretty sketchy things in his time, apparently. Prince Charles met Duchess Camilla, aka Parker Bowles, for the first time in the 1970s, and that's where he fell helplessly in love with her. However, Parker Bowles was not considered royal material since she was not virginal. Yeah, they have a weird uh, rule about that one, apparently. Very, very weird. When Charles was away fulfilling naval duties, Parker Bowles got engaged and was eventually married to her on again, off again partner, Andrew Parker Bowles. From the very beginning, Princess Diana was aware of Prince Charles' inappropriate relationship with Duchess Camilla. Despite Princess Diana's reservations, Prince Charles' current wife was also at their wedding. Ooh, that's awkward. By 1981, the crown deemed it time for the prince to be married. Though he had dated her older sister previously, the prince became engaged to 19-year-old Lady Diana Spencer. Kind of doomed from the start, no? Apparently, the princess said in an interview, I remember saying to my husband, why is this lady around? And he said, well, I refuse to be the only prince of Wales who never had a mistress. Right out in the open, eh? Like, why even marry then, you know? Call me old-fashioned, but like, Till death do you part, you know? During their rocky marriage, both Princess Diana and Prince Charles carried out affairs. I guess when it's done, it's uh, really done. Prince Charles' most well-known affair was with his now wife, Queen Consort to the United Kingdom. Of course, we all remember the infamous and risque phone call conversation in 1992 that was leaked. During the phone conversation, the King of England said some pretty explicit stuff. Yeah, Google it up. He said it, not me. Number four, King Edward VIII. Where do I start with this man? He's more controversial than Harry. Can you believe it? Don't worry, we'll get to him soon enough. And make sure you like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out, you know? We all know this man, this man, King Edward VIII, and how he infamously rejected the crown in 1936 so that he could marry a divorced American woman. Oh, scandalous. Hey, guy had to follow his heart. And that heart took him a lot of places, including Germany. Edward was in love, and much like the young princes of today, they're not necessarily hooked on the idea of marrying those arranged or fit for them. They follow their heart. King Edward was in love with one Mrs. Wallace Simpson, an American woman, but also a married woman. Also once divorced. Breaks the rules, Eddie. However, in order to marry the woman that he loved, King Edward was willing to give up his power. And he did. Talk about passion. On January 10th, 1931, Prince Edward and Mrs. Wallace Simpson met for the first time, as well as her then husband, Ernest Simpson. Yeah, it was at this party that the first two met and fell in love. Awkward third wheel situation there, kinda. That's gotta suck being the one left for royalty, doesn't it? That's a confidence crusher. Yeah, she left me. For who? Uh, the king. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Number three, Prince Harry. There's a couple things Prince Harry has done to solidify that bad boy reputation among the royals. Well, maybe less bad boy and just very bad decisions sometimes, you know? We're never gonna know why Prince Harry thought it was a good idea to wear a certain armband and a uniform resembling of that African German army to a theme party. Yeah, not so royalty stuff like that. We all remember in 2005 when the then 20 year old and the photos of him in the costume leaked online. What's with these leaders doing all these themed costume parties? Yeah, I'm looking at you Trudeau. Once the images were published, the palace was forced to do some damage control. Of course, the prince issued an apology saying, quote, I am very sorry if I have caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. And that's pretty well it. Ah, a little sorry here and there. Or how about in 2004 when he decided it was a pretty good idea to get into a little brawl with photographers who were taking his picture when leaving a nightclub. And of course, countless times we caught the prince shirtless or making out with girlfriends for an all out not what to do on the internet media presence. I mean, the guy's just having fun. He's living his life. What do people expect, you know? What is he gonna play polo on a horse every day and just sit on a throne? But how far do apologies go, right? Well, 
Apparently, the future king and his brother Harry haven't really spoken since the infamous interview on Oprah when Harry and his partner Meghan Markle. Apparently, the future king and his brother Harry haven't really spoken since the infamous interviews on Oprah when Harry and his partner Meghan Markle opened up about the racist scrutiny that they had been under for years from both family and media. Quote, Many lines were crossed by William. He was at the center of a number of painful moments, turning his back when support was needed. It was a dark time, and one William hasn't really been prepared to unpack. At the same time, Prince William is still waiting for an apology from Harry for making details of private family matters public. Number two, Banished Cousins. We all know a family member that maybe aren't too thrilled about or fond at the annual barbecue to see. A little family history, a little Oh great, look, so-and-so is here. Born in 1919 and 1926, Nerissa and Catherine Bowles Lyon were two of the daughters of John Herbert. John was the brother of the Queen Mother, and so Nerissa and Catherine were first cousins of Queen Elizabeth. Royal first cousins, tempting for some and hated by others. Sadly though, they were never really able to live the life of a royal family member. In the medical terminology of the early 1940s, the sisters were diagnosed as, quote, imbeciles and never really learned to speak. In 1941, they were admitted to the now closed Royal Earlswood Institution for Mental Defectives and were allegedly treated by their family as though they never existed. That's creepy. In a 1963 edition of Burke's Peerage, basically a family lineage chart, it listed Nerissa as passing away in 1940 and Catherine passing away in 1961 but they weren't dead at all. It wasn't until 1987 that the story of the sisters' existence was even published. In fact, it was reported that Nerissa actually had died in 1986, and Catherine was still alive at the time, sadly passing away in 2014. A scandal instantly erupted when it emerged the royal family had apparently tried to erase two of its members from their lives. In a 2011 documentary titled The Queen's Hidden Cousins, nurses and staff at Earlswood were interviewed and confirmed that to their knowledge, the royal family had never even sent the sisters a card, gift, or visit, sadly. In fact, when Nerissa died, none of the family was at the attendance of the funeral. That is horrible. Number one, cousin kissers. Speaking of lineage and keeping the bloodline, well, within the bloodline, the royals have had their fair share on incestuous relationships, straining back almost a thousand years. The Egyptians did it, the Romans did it, and of course, the Brits have done it. Hey, when you're perfect, it's hard to find anything else perfect. Of course, lots of the royal family has been related to the people they marry. Cousins, again. A small theme with the royals. Not only do they like banishing them, sometimes and more often than once, they fall in love with them. King George IV and Caroline of Brunswick, first cousins. Queen Victoria's uncle King George IV married his cousin Caroline. George was the son of King George III, who was the younger brother of Princess Augusta Frederica. Caroline was the daughter of Princess Augusta Frederica. Of course, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert are first cousins as well. Yeah, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were first cousins, having shared the same grandfather, Francis, Duke of saxe coburg salfield Victoria was the daughter of Francis' daughter, Princess Victoria of saxe coburg salfield Albert was the son of Francis' son, Ernest III, Duke of saxe coburg salfield and, in 1863, King Edward VII, who was then known as Prince Albert Edward, married Alexandra of Denmark. Edward was the son of Queen Victoria and was the great-great-grandson of King George II. Queen Alexandra of Denmark was also a great-great-granddaughter of King George II, making them third cousins. And of course, we come to the late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, third cousins. Both Queen Elizabeth II and her husband, Prince Philip, could call Queen Victoria great-great-grandma, making them related. Elizabeth is the great-granddaughter of King Edward VII, Queen Victoria's son. Philip's great-grandmother was Princess Alice, Queen Victoria's daughter. Dude, trust me, I had cue cards laid out on the floor while researching this. I felt like I was mapping the Game of Thrones family tree. Yeah, so many Williams and Edwards, you know? Like, we need some new names, people. 